Okay, today's project is this Sony uh, surround sound amplifier or end receiver STR-DE475 This is actually one I used myself down in the shed um, I actually scored it, it was going to go in the dumpster, it was out of a friend's video store uh, when they were shutting it down but it actually had some faults with it which just turned out to be lots of dry joints with it um, oh, was it with it? I thought the front panel plugged into the other board but some are on the front panel here I think the volume control, some of the other connectors had some dry joints on them and it's been going for about five years I think perfectly well but now one of the channels has dropped right down in volume I've actually got to have the um, balance control right over to one channel fully to get the two channels to the same level so I'm guessing it's probably some of these little capacitors in here somewhere um, certainly starting to show signs of having a bit of effective heat in it um, you've got these like pre-driver ICs here and um, they sort of do all the early, instead of having lots of preamps, pre-drive stages and stuff in these modern amps, they just use a couple of chips, uh, even when they don't have chips for outputs. So they sort of, originally they had lots of pre-drive transistors and output transistors, and they had some pre-drive transistors and went to SDK output chips, and now they've kind of gone the other way, which is output transistors driven by a couple of uh, driver chips. And there's a lot of... Um, regulators or something here, transistors, another one over here and you can see they run pretty hot, the board's starting to discolour around them and especially these driver chips, they're often common these driver chips for getting dry joints on them as well uh, luckily there's no surface mount looking capacitors here anyway, there's some little tiny, those little little miniature ones there and there's some up against these resistors in the output stage but this hasn't been run particularly loud or anything so it's probably just the the quiescent current and just general power draws it does run warm regardless so that's probably starting to fry some of these electros so we'll have a look hopefully we can get the board out of this easily but probably not now it's one of these units it looks like we'll have to take the whole base off uh, most of these surround amps are pretty horrible to work on uh, this one's actually fairly empty inside some of the, the big bigger ones, higher quality ones, have just got boards everywhere, or well, the ones with, I don't think this has even got HDMI now, because I'm pretty sure he, the guy I got it off bought this new in the late 90s, I think, or around the year 2000, I think that was when it was, yeah, it would have been around that time, so I think this is one of the ones he bought for a different business he had, and then put in the video store, so it's had a lot of run in the video store, would have been running all day, every day, Transformer's actually still warm, even now, and I haven't ran it for a while, um, so we'll have a look, um, you can, some of these electrodes look a little bit like the plastic starting to peel back um, I'm not going to bother like recapping the whole thing but I'll definitely be checking the ESR of the ones around these driver chips and probably these ones up against the resistors um, it could also be somewhere in the signal processing but also that board just for digital optical connections and stuff so we won't worry about that because I don't use that I don't use the surround, I just put it in stereo mode and use it as a hi-fi amp which is still probably not as good as a real hi-fi hi amp which I might actually upgrade this and put in another hi-fi amp I have but this has just been handy because it uh, replaced another Sony I had before which failed a, a, a shelf system and it's been doing the job pretty well so I wouldn't mind getting it going again if it's simple and I thought I'd make a good video anyway if nothing else might as well find out what's wrong with it uh, we'll have to hook up a signal generator I guess and just check the levels on both channels and should find ones down. I've already swapped speakers, swapped the input channels just to make sure it wasn't that. So it looks like one of these channels is definitely down. And look at it, how hot it's been. It's bound to be some 40 electros in here somewhere. But I'll I'll get the thing to bits and yeah, knowing these, I'm probably get, you probably have to unscrew the main board, take the back panel off first, all the screws around all the connectors and stuff. Might even be able to get rid of some of these loose boards and tu and the tuner and stuff. Unplug them and just remove them this other socket board here and then you have to take this main board off obviously the front panel also has to come off main board the transformer and the power board all have to come off and have to work on them loose basically which not the best way possibly we can just leave the transformer this might have enough wiring and I might be able to take the back off might even try that see if I can take the back off the cable tied down might might have to take the back and front off and see if this board will tilt and might be able to just leave it because it's a lot safer with it transformer and power board which has 240 volts on it if they're all 
all left on the on the base but i'll have a look and see what i can do with it a bit of good news sony actually still making stuff to be repaired easily which is good to see so i basically just removed the rear panel up, got rid of the tuner out of the way and this other board which hopefully isn't part of the signal chain i don't think it is i've left this other one in here because that may be part of the audio signal chain even though it's just a digital or an optical connection but anyway once you take out the few there's four screws holding the heat sink and another three or so holding the board in and it just tilts up nicely with the transformer and everything in place front panel still on so i can tip that right over if i want to to access everything underneath which is a great way of doing it i can already see a dry joint on that transistor or voltage regulator there yeah, and then like i say these this is the bottom of those two driver chips there's also this other i think an stk or something chip i noticed in there yeah stk 350 230 would be another driver chip i think hidden under this other board and yeah she's very close to needing a a resolder anyway these joints are very close to dry if not actually dry although i didn't have any channels dropping out or anything but they're common for doing it these amp chips because they run very hot and probably just the cooling and expansion the uh, uh, cooling and heating up is enough to do it even our speaker relays i think they are there yeah bank of relays obviously there's three in here because it's a multi-channel amp so it's not just the front ones but there's definitely dry looking joints starting to show on those and no doubt where was the power section down this way i think oh, i can see some big pins here that would be the heat sinks yeah three pin transistor transistor or oh, your yeah, 7885 that says that's so most likely a regulator yeah they're as dry as a bit hard to tell this might have lead free solder in it or it might be just prior to that that often looks pretty bad even when it's okay but that whatever that is has hardly been soldered in it that's one of those resistors i think so yeah sony Ooh, interesting put a very massive lack of solder on that that one's barely attached to the circuit board at all it's got a little bit of solder one side so when that went through the wave soldering machine it didn't attach very well so yeah this board wants a a good going over all those free driver chips voltage regulators anything that looks like it's been hot check around the output stages I might see if I can do a close-up to show some of these dry joints because it's yeah even all these little resistors and stuff around those driver chips not looking too good and the other thing yeah thankfully they've marked all these electro electrolytic capacitors under the board so it would just be a matter of going around with the ESR meter I mean, one thing I should really be doing is checking there's a couple looks like they're there a couple of big filter caps first test with something like this is always get your multimeter onto, onto the voltage range and get across these big electrodes because they can hold quite a bit there's only four volts left in that one and that one's zero still best to check because if, if, if you've got an actual 40 amp they may stay charged and they could be up anywhere from 30 to 60 odd volts which can be enough to give you a bad shock or even possibly kill you so best to always check those even with the power off i've got it completely unplugged out of the power point at the moment and um yeah i'll just see if i can do a close-up of this circuit board to show the sort of condition it's in okay i've got a different lens on the camera now i'm just going to manual focus so i'll just have to manually adjust the distance to try and get this right and we're looking at the that's the output transistors at the bottom i'll get the hang of this in a minute one of those resistors yeah there it is right in the middle of the screen those sort of three pins which are about in the middle now the left one of those has got a big hole around it it has actually put a decent bit of solder on one side of it so it has done the job all right but that's a factory fault there and then there's another one there you can see the r605 so it's a three pin resistor common in amps on the output stage i think they're the emitter resistors could be wrong but but now if we come further up the board here that looks like a heat sink i can't actually see what i'm looking at oh, this is yeah this is around the power section i think yeah 7805 so pins on these are not looking the best actually looks like a little bit of 
corrosion or something there and that's um, I think is that the relays here yeah, there's you've got four pins at the top of the contacts and two pins sort of in line with them down below that's the actual coils and you can see those coil sides are not too good there's definitely cracking around the solder joint there which is a dry joint about to happen and yeah those regulators which run quite hot and they're on heat sinks it's often a sign that or cause of expansion and contraction now here we are on the this is one of the driver chips that feeds those output transistors and you can see the pins especially on the left hand end are pretty bad on that common cause of intermittent channel dropout on amps and that's, that's the next one so that's probably a stereo one so it's probably rear channels and front channels or something in each chip and you can see some of the links and resistors and stuff around there are not looking too good either yeah, if I can get it focused and yeah there's some definitely iffy looking joints so everything that gets pretty hot around there this is the other chip that STK thing I don't think the joints on that are too bad but I'll go over them anyway but that's the main part of the amp that's bad if, if things like connectors and stuff tend to play out that's some sort of little chip that's pre-amplifier or something not sure what it is there's some um, RCA sockets it's the back of the board basically and they actually don't look too bad but again always worth a check if you got the board out of it just go over anything some of the there's the speaker terminals that's the rears which I don't even use there's the front ones often you'll find yeah that one of those does look a bit like it's that second one from the left looks a bit like it's got a bit of a ring around it in this in the middle of the solder pad which is a sign that it's starting to crack it's one of our filter capacitors uh, where's the other one there they look all right so they've been well soldered which is good to see but yeah with years of use you start finding things it's starting to go that is dry as whatever that is it's like a, a little connector or a transistor a couple of pins on that don't look too good and this whole general area is a little bit iffy in places even things like those resistors but sometimes with the lead solder it'll look a bit like that it'll be dull the old um well, sorry lead free solder with the old leaded solder tin and lead you'd every joint should look fairly shiny and smooth whereas the unleaded solder often looks dull like it's a dry joint but there's nothing wrong with it you can usually tell it's leaded or unleaded solder because leaded will melt easily and unleaded um, tends to be harder to melt I forget what it's made out of tin and something else I think the unleaded stuff so it's got a higher melting point I think it just generally seems to be harder to use but not the end of the world but like I say this amp would be right around the period I think when they would have been switching over from one to the other or close to it might have been yeah it would have been early 2000s that they went for the unleaded stuff but yeah that chip there definitely needs a solder don't know if I can get my bracket there to actually show soldering it you should see when you put soldering on and often the solder will suck back from around where that crack is away from the pins and stuff so you know it was definitely a pretty iffy joint when that happens and then you just refresh it with some nice new stuff okay I'm on one of the I think there's a bit of a square thing if I can get the soldering iron tip in focus but that's one of the chips along here that those sort of uh what do you call that zigzag pins for want of a better word staggered ones and there's a couple of resistors and stuff up here assume they're resistors they aren't too good so we'll put a bit of solder on that and just see what happens I haven't used this for a while but I tin the tip up a bit Okay, so that's all going on that pin there. It's a bit hard to see, but the solder is sort of not looking too good on it, breaking up a little bit as you put the heat onto it. And of course, being very careful not to bridge anything out here. We don't want any pins joined together, that shouldn't be, because you'll probably blow something up we are up the stage or buy a chip or whatever so you always got to check these afterwards I'm doubtful this is anything to do with the, the low volume on one channel but this is what it's doing because soon it will be one channel dropping in and out it might last a few more years but 
this is getting pretty close to being dry joints if it's just sat there it might be all right but even then like I say the heat heat cycles are turning these on and off I think I'll just bridge that is enough to to cause these sort of issues yeah these resistors I don't know if it's still in shot but I'm a bit out of shot but right up the border not looking very good now, I'm not sure what that is but that's got a bad crack around it I don't think those chips are on heat sinks it might just be a test point or something I'm not sure what that big pin is and I think these are in shot aren't they? Yeah, there's those really bad oh, that's got a proper ring all the way around it yeah when you touch it it sort of sucks a bit hard to see but it will, it will suck so you can see a bit of a gap opening up there didn't get much on there that's a sign it's really bad but yeah, just daub a bit more fresh solder on there. No need to remove the old stuff or anything. Oops, I've bridged across there a little bit. I think it's only onto the green lacquer, but not worth the risk. Now this is the second chip here. Probably don't need to see all that, but that's, that's done one of them. There's another capacitor or something there. It's not looking very good, so this whole area really needs needs to be resoldered almost the whole board needs reflowing it's, it's that bad so that one's just opened up a hopefully you can see that where is it there a bit of a hole where the old solder's broken so you just reflow new stuff in there to completely cover all that back up and the flux should get in sort of retin everything but yeah this board's terrible really it's a problem with a lot of these new ones i think all these little small tracks and stuff doesn't help it tends to cause them to they've got tiny little pads in them now they used to have quite big components and big pads on the boards and also everything's just jammed together so it gets a lot hotter whereas the old amps used to usually have quite a bit more space in them especially these surround ones because they've got all the extra electronics for switching video and all that sort of stuff so that's all more heat generated there's another one that's set on camera just there it's a bit out of focus in that spot but that's actually opened up on the side and I'll bridge there but it's only onto the same circuit board track anyway but yeah these are absolutely terrible I mean it's I say I'm pretty much at the stage where I could chuck this amp out and not really care but it's a good little project in resurrecting something Anyway, that'll probably do, just give an idea of what needs to be done. Here you can see these other other ones at the end here. This is the beginning of the next chip here. And here you can see even that, that pad below it. Where is it? It's a link, I think. Could be a resistor on the other side there. But that's in pretty awful condition. Ooh, I tell you that. Pin the way it's bent's almost going to cause a short without me bridging it probably not though I don't know why they've done it like that in the factory that's don't like the look of that myself but it probably doesn't matter but yeah fancy bending one pin towards the other pad but anyway what are these end pins that one's opened up on one side as soon as I touched it but yeah, you just need to go over afterwards and check it Make sure you haven't bridged anything out. Like my eyesight's not as good as it used to be, so I tend to have to magnify it a little bit even, just to make sure at least if you get the board and move it around in the light, you can usually find an angle where you can see the pads shining and, and tell the difference because the flux tends to shine along with the solder, so you need to know there's obviously going to be flux bridging things out, but that's not going to matter. You can clean it all off if you want to. I tend to be pretty slack and not bother with this sort of equipment because it doesn't really matter that much. But yeah, certain equipment you're certainly meant to clean all the flux off the board and surface mount stuff and the like. It's best to clean it up. This whole through hole stuff doesn't matter too much. But yeah, even going right along here. Where's that um, resistor that had a big bit missing? I'll get that one while I think of it because that could cause a 
problem if that drops out it might, could blow an amp channel or something if one of the outputs suddenly drops out or starts intermittently connecting but anyway that'll do for that for the moment we'll get some signal hooked up to this thing and see if I can actually chase through like normally if, if I was just doing a repair for someone I would probably just go straight to the ESR meter at this point which I'll just grab and and start measuring caps and just anything that looks shoddy you'd replace it and then you just plug it in and test it and see if it works rather than bother, bothering with signal tracing because any caps in here that look iffy if I was doing this as a repair for someone anything in that around those chips I'd probably just replace a lot of them um, while you've got it to bits you might as well just replace everything that's been hot and that way I'll keep the customer happy she'll go for a, a few years without any problems okay so look at the top of the board again little board out of the way but there's our two pre-driver amp chips there's all our transistors up the back here so I've resoldered everything found this connector over here which goes to the front panel really dry connections on it which occasionally the amp when I turned it off it would turn back on again I thought it might be the button but the button does feel good so it could well have been something to do with that connector but I've measured a few of these capacitors here from the back of the board with the ESR meter and here some are like measuring 77 I think one was open circuit so they're definitely pretty fried those ones like I say without even hooking this up Rover. but we're gonna have to redo the, the focus a bit so this is our, our couple of driver chips here and now the transistors down the bottom there Get that in the shot, probably not. But you can make out that some of these have little capacitor code things on the back. But at zero, this thing got my ESR meter. There's an electro there that's reading 86, which is high even for a low value capacitor. That one is 25, I think, if I can make a good connection to it. 25, which is probably even on the high side for a very low capacitor, low value capacitor. Yeah, that one's, if that is where that other one is, it's open circuit completely. Then on the other chip, if that is an electro, that's open. That joint's still a little dry there, I didn't quite get that one right. Yeah, that one's open as well. That's probably a channel that's not working. Good, they all seem to be open circuit on that side. There's a couple on the back here somewhere as well. What have we got? 1.1, that should be a good one, unless it's a really high value, but they look like small. That one's 22. Yeah, where are they on the other channel? There's a couple more. There's one up here. 9.4 is probably reasonable. There's a little one here and around the power supply. 2.3, so that's probably okay. That one seems to be open circuit. So there's probably a bit of rubbish coming through from the power supply as well. It almost looks like a bridge something there, but I think it's just the flux. Yeah, the flux is just shiny as, so it almost looks like a bad solder joint. I'm probably going to have to resolder that other one anyway, wherever it was. I can't see it now. It was a bad solder oh, there, I think. Yeah, that's the one. That'll have to come out, I think, because that capacitor's probably shot. So we've got one, one, that's that one there. And that seems to measure open circuit. That is a little one, which I might have to get the focus right again, probably. Hard to tell where it is. There's one in amongst these voltage regulators here. That measures open, I think the other one measured okay. It's a bit of a shame you can't get the SR meter onto most of these from the top of the board, but I might be able to just get in there. If I'm on that one, it's and these are the, the ones I was measuring before, this row of three of them. Along what is the back of the chip, it's got the writing on the other side. These all seem to measure high or open. Whether I can connect on from the top of the board is a whole other thing. 
these other two on the other side seem to be okay depending 10 mic 100 volts so yeah they'd normally measure a reasonable ESR and I guess the other thing to check would probably be there's probably a couple more around here that need I can see them from below oh yeah here they are there's one there no, the meter's gone off side of it now is it one of the, uh was it one of those no i think it was somewhere else now i've completely lost oh it was oh, i have to flip the board over again the ones over near this other transistor was what i was looking at there's one there 3.3 not too bad i think this one down here i was trying to measure that's open circuit by the look of it if i'm actually on the right pins that should be right in line with this cap here and with this uh transistor what is it uh 78 is that a say 7807 didn't know they even made 7 volt regulators but that's what it says 78 mo 7 so that one below it seems to be shot and there's another cap below that and yeah, it's measuring open that's next to our amp chips I'm guessing this channel here might be the faulty channel because all the caps on this one seem to measure is open Oh, actually, that one's maybe measuring okay. Let's see if I can get a good connection. No. Oh, yeah. Ugh. I'm getting a random measurement coming up and then it disappears. So, assuming this ESR meter's working alright. One's on the back here. That one's high, probably a bit high at 23. Yeah, the other one's 1.1. 1 .1. Let's just measure some other random ones. That's 17. 17, they're probably very low value though. They're coming into the amp stage. They're those little tiny ones. I think they're 50 volt one mic. Probably even a little high for that. Where am I at? One microfarad. Oh no. They should be up around 16, so it's 15, so they're actually alright. So they're obviously out in the open enough that they haven't been cooked. Now where were the ones? There's ones on the ends of these resistors. There's one. Yeah, it actually seems to measure okay. So it's just the ones jammed in around those driver chips, ironically. Because like I say, I, I haven't used it particularly high power, so I guess the amp chips have never been overly hot. All the heat's probably coming from these drivers. I don't know why they don't, they probably should be put on a heat sink, those chips, because in just about every amp, you look in modern amp that's got them, they both all the joints are fried and all the capacitors around them are fried as well. So, now the other thing I want to look at, we'll be over, probably a bit out of focus now again. Now I don't know if I'll put too far off the, into the periphery of the lens there, but we'll look at some around those other transistors and voltage regulator ICs, whatever they are. No, they actually seem to measure alright. They look like they're in a higher temperature area, but where were the other ones? That's one of them. Yeah, this connector here, it's got Q723, which is not the connector. But they, yeah, the soldering was terrible on this connector, which goes to the front panel. Doesn't seem to be a lot of electric, oh there, here we go, here's another one. 0.27, so that's definitely okay, unless it's... Well, that one seems to measure open circuit. What's that electro? This little one here. Which is 100 mic, 35 volt. Oh, very hard to read what capacitor that is. If that's it, that is open a circuit as well. So I probably should get the old Sharpie out. And normally I just yeah, put a black mark on top of the ones that... That one was crap. That, all those ones around that amp chip. One's right up against the face of it. Again, not a, I guess it's 
easy for them to design the circuit board that way with them right next to the chip. Now I think one of these other ones probably best to replace all these anyway, everything around everything that's in around these heat sinks of these voltage regulators, you can see it's pretty well cooked, so I'll probably change all those. The three on each along the front of the um, driver chips. And we've got this one over here. Seems to be open circuit. I think these ones are measuring okay. Or did I check those? The other so there's two in front of that transistor or that regulator. I think I checked those and they look alright. Yeah, 3.9 and 5.2 and where did I see a couple more? Down here I think. 0.29 that's okay. 0.14. Oh, there's these other two over here. I don't think there's anything particularly hot there but while I'm in here I might as well check them. 1.8 and 1.9, so that's pretty good on the ESR. They look like only low value ones. I mean, technically, I should be checking the value on the face of every capacitor, but since this is only my job, I'm not going to care if they're a little bit out. Like I say, they're, they're not in amongst any heat, but anything around heat sinks and that just that regulator sitting there, even without a heat sink, usually the bigger caps will be alright because they've got a bit of thermal, so they can handle a bit of heat because of the size of them. It takes a bit to heat them up. And there's the three other little ones. Over under this connector here, right on the edge of the board, uh, to see there, but three little electros there. We've got some bridge rectifiers and stuff, like they've been running hot. So definitely more that you want to check. Five, that might be worth checking in what value that's meant to be. That's three point something. Two point nine, is that them? Yeah, that's the set of them. But anyway, thing that's around heat. 2.2, 2.9, that may be a bit high, depending if they're 100 mics or anything, but I've got a 47, 47, maybe they're all 47s, where's the other one, 47, which lower voltage, yeah, up to about 1.6, so they are probably starting to go, yeah, that 5 one's not very good, 2.2 is probably within range, 2.9, so they're all yeah, on their way a little bit. I might just mark that top one. Probably wouldn't have to replace a lot of them. I don't know what they actually do. But given they're in the power supply, I might just mark all those for a replacement. I've got millions of 47 microfarad replacement caps. So yeah, I've checked the ones along these resistors. They seem alright, these little ones down here all measure okay. There is another STK chip, like I said, up there. There's one capacitor right there at the front of that. Definitely worth a check. Basically, anywhere where there's heat or potential of heat, that's measuring 10. But is it a little one? Of course, the value is always on the opposite side to what you can see. I still can't see where the value is. I don't know if they put it. I've got temperature value. Oh, it's written in there, is it? Get the dust off it might help. No, that's a 50, 4 point, 50 volt, 4.7. That would be around that, yeah, that's around 15. That was measuring 10, so that's okay. But, um, yeah, if I was really game, I mean, if you were doing a, a restoration on an amp or something, you'd probably just replace a lot of them and actually recap it. But this is only a modern amp, not really worth anything at the moment. Probably never will be a classic. There's a lot of little caps up around the RCA sockets and stuff, but because they're spread out and nowhere near the heat, yeah, they, they probably age in a little bit just from the general amount of heat in, inside an amplifier, but most of this heat would be going straight up and out the vents. And yeah, from the look of it, there's a lot more heat coming from these regulators and those ICs than there is from the output transistors. So, really, these probably could have done with another aluminium heatsink here somewhere to mount all that on, and the thing would be reliable as, but. I guess they looked at the specs and thought, oh, well, it runs within whatever its range is meant to be, should be fine. But yeah, if you sort of run them, because I do, do give this quite long hours, when I'm working on the computer, I usually got some music running, so it does get a bit of use, but not at a very high volume, so it's just that quiescent current and stuff running through these is enough to fry everything, even if you don't use it much. But so the next job will be to find, some, find out what value all these capacitors are, 
and start replacing all those. I will try and I better hook this up with a signal generator and stuff so we can just have a look at it might actually be worth since this board's easy to work on fiff it up and I'll try and trace get both channels running off a one kilohertz signal or something at the same level just you know put put a mono signal in split it into step into the two RCAs on the input and then we can probably compare the two channels and just see how you actually fault find um, low signal level we'll be able to see the the height of the waveform on one side and the height on the other side I'll have to put the balance control back to where it was because yeah, one of these channels is almost uh, qu completely quiet when you're at normal balance in the middle and no doubt this other one is probably a lot quieter than it should be because if the caps are starting to go on that more than likely this whole amp is running a lot quieter than it should just because all the the little coupling capacitors around these chips are shot and uh, won't hurt to replace these other ones in the power supply I haven't heard any weird actually I have heard a little bit of digital noise out of this thing I, I thought it was actually because I'm running it off a USB converter but sometimes when this thing's quiet there is a little bit of hashy sound coming out of the speakers which could well be these other capacitors are letting some rubbish through um, if you've got decoupling capacitors because there's some digital circuitry in here you might be getting feedback a lot back if it's running this digital audio board something like that or even the fluorescent display driver chip something like that if that's on the same rail as your preamps or whatever um, and the electrolytic capacitor is shot on that rail somewhere which will be right back where the regulator is that'll actually feed back and can put rubbish into your audio section so that's another reason you tend to check everything uh, if it's a non-digital amp probably not going to matter often you find these caps are open circuit and there's still no hum or anything but it's but they are like high frequency bypasses and that sort of thing because um, you can get a bit of noise out of the, the um, regulator chips and stuff as well so always best to replace them if they're shot uh, even though you may not really notice anything it's also possible you could get some rubbish that's actually running into the amp all the time and m might make it run a bit hotter if it's got some sort of signal even if it's too high to even hear out of the speakers you may be getting some digital rubbish going in and, and basically causing the amp to run a bit even though you think it's silent so it's always best to replace those and like I say just anything that's around hot parts which you, this amp's old enough now you can see the board the green's going a darker almost black in colour browny sort of colour so that's that's a dead giveaway in amplifiers of what's running hot and you'll find 99% of your faults in an amplifier or television or anything will always be around these hot bits usually electrolytic capacitors can be other stuff but that'll normally just be these capacitors are fried from the heat so I'll, I'll get this hooked up to a signal generator and we'll have a look at it might as well do an actual bit of fault finding for a change like I say most of the time if I was repairing this for someone I'd just literally pull it to bits get the ESR meter resold the dry joints change all the faulty caps and plug it back in without even firing up the oscilloscope or anything and just that'd be enough to to get it going normally just with an ear test you might just do a quick test with the signal uh, going into it just make sure it looks like it's a clean waveform but um, a lot of time in consumer repairs you just the consumer wants it going again as quick as possible or it might just be a second hand saw or whatever they just want the thing running again so you kind of find the faulty parts replace them and get it back out the door as quick as possible at the cheapest price for them but uh, if you want to be a real real um, sort of hi-fi buff about it you'd, you'd really want to put a known level into this and then check the output in relation to that all that sort of thing check the waveforms for cleanliness and all the rest make sure both channels are identical in output that's always one test worth doing especially when you've got one channel down I'd normally in a fault like this you'd normally you can tell with with just your ears really but it doesn't hurt to put a, a sine wave in each side put it on your dual channel oscilloscope side by side and just make sure they are pretty much identical level there's nothing you can adjust in these but it gives you an idea that that all the components are still intact because they should should be within a very close tolerance when they were made and um, you know, I guess that's why they give you a balance control you can tweak it slightly if you need to but when it comes out of the factory both channels should be about identical there's probably you know five percent tolerance bearable on it in volume level but um, it's best to best in it after you fix the fault in one of these just to check it like I say in when it's silent make sure there's no rubbish coming out of the outputs which could be due to this digital some sort of digital artifacts noise and stuff getting back into the to the audio section from the digital stuff and then just yeah check the two channels side by side with the same input level 
and make sure they look very close and then you know you pretty well fixed it then um, it should, should be within sort of 5% tolerance or something I would think uh, certainly humans aren't going to hear down to that level of difference so I'm back onto this Sony amplifier again after a couple of months break busy doing other things and I've just been trying to get this up and running so I could do a couple of signal tests on it but it doesn't want to play ball um, first thing I found with this, I can't actually even remember now exactly what how bad the sound going through it was but it doesn't only seems to be making a buzzing sound out of the speakers now another thing I found of course which is common with a lot of this modern audio gear is if you take the back panel off there's these little earth uh, where are they there's one on the, the speaker there which is just out of shot there's another one where this lead goes I've got a screw on there if I unplug the signal going into it there's actually some metal around the RCA sockets there probably be better to try and get that in focus a bit more now that I'm up the top of the board so there's a metal band going around it's not actually connected to that to their normal signal earth there's another one right along the end here you can see this bit of metal silver stuff around this red socket and it comes out to a screw hole there so a lot of these units if you take the back cover off they've actually connected these various things together and the thing won't work without them they're actually part of the circuit so what I was finding was with the back panel off this amp that if I turned it on it would come on and then go into protect mode so what I've had to do is connect a screw to this this is a CD input and whatever's next to it which is mini disc and tape play and record there so you have to connect the earth around this CD socket to this earth up the other end here on the that's the main left and right front speaker output so if you hook those together the others don't seem to make any difference you actually at least get the amp to turn on with the back cover off doesn't seem to care about the couple of earthing points for the on the circuit board I can still have that up in the air like this and it'll run but like I said I can't remember this actually had much signal going through it but all I'm getting is a bit of a buzzing sound which is probably some digital noise from some of these other foldy caps so I think the easiest thing I managed to trace the signal through a bit with the oscilloscope but it goes this chip here which is actually runs quite warm which may be something to do with the caps in the power supply or maybe that's just how it, it runs that's your main audio processing IC I did thanks to electrotenure.com I think it's called I managed to get a manual so there's this great big postage stamp chip here that um, switches all the signals does the volume and input selection and all that stuff by the look of it and then it feeds into what we've got the three these are the amp chips on the board, the pre-driver things for the transistor outputs. So you've got your centre channel. And then what they've actually done, I thought the, I expected these to be like left and right for the front in one chip and left and right for the back or rear channels in the other one. But it turns out they've actually got the left for front and rear in one chip and the right front and rear in the other chip. So you can't even, like if you, I was just actually thinking of disconnecting one of these chips from the power or ripping it out completely because then I don't have so much heat and stuff running in here but it turns out yeah one's for each channel so I can't just do that little easy thing so I might just change the caps in it and see how that goes that's all I'd normally do I wouldn't stuff around trying to chase the signal uh, we've got a bit more of the circuit here there's just a lot of little transistors and stuff feeding into our output which are all Darlington by the look of it so I'm not sure if they're I don't think they're muting because the muting's in the other one but there's a whole lot of what have we got? Booster, booster. So even out of those, limiter, limiter. So this, these are the signals coming out of those preamp sort of chips, which are actually, you know, low volume sort of or low wattage amplifier chips. And we've still got quite a bit of circuitry here. Lots of little transistors before we get to our output stages. Some sort of overload detector there by the look of it. So quite a mess. And then we've got our output relay switching. Oh, no, and the associated transistors and I guess fault detection there, DC detectors and finally get to our output stage but I won't be bothering doing too much with that I think we'll just get in um, there's a lot of 100 mic 10 volt capacitors in here around those chips just make sure I unplug that for the mains and I've got the speakers and stuff in at the moment so I might as well get rid of that and just here yeah, keep this lead in place if I want to test it afterwards it's possible that the reason I'm not getting sound at the moment is something to do with the video or tuner board being out I can't imagine that would cause that but 
you never know with these things just having anything unplugged can do weird things or it could be that some of these other rows do have to be connected but um, so I may have to put the back panel on to even test this but if, if you ever get weird problems on these modern amps or modern com um, little mini hi-fi systems and stuff it can just be when you pull it apart and take the back panel off or even the bottom cover or something it'll be enough to disconnect these various earth paths or whatever they are and you can get all sorts of weird symptoms from that so it always pays just to put reassemble the thing if you get some fault you didn't have before I checked my soldering and hadn't put any bridges in or anything silly like that and I thought oh, I bet it's a, the back cover so it's always a, a, a thing that can catch you out on these when you try to run them without the covers on them sometimes they just don't want to work normally the top cover you can take off but the back and stuff starts causing problems so we'll get in and all these little caps I marked with black marks before and there's a few in the power section I'll get in and replace those hopefully I've got them all and I think I'll just put 63 volt 100 mics which are quite a bit bigger but I'll mount them up off the board out of the heat a bit and hopefully that'll stop them cooking as much since they're right down next to these chips it almost wants a bit of aluminium or something putting on these chips to cool them down a bit but um, you know it's only really a throwaway amp anyway but if you wanted these things to last a bit longer it wouldn't hurt to heat sink these couple of ICs there the, the pre-drive ones the center channel one which is a different chip seems to be okay but these two what are they UPC something uh, where do they go UPC 2581s so that's those two ones but yeah they're like almost like I say like mono car amplifier or something type ICs uh, well these in this case they're stereo some of them used mono ones one for each channel this has actually got two channels in each, two, the left front and rear and the right front and rear and the other. And they do tend to run fairly hot. Um, they must have quite a bit of quiescent current or whatever running through them. And so they just tend to cook a bit. I don't know why, they really should have put a little bit of a heat sink on there, but I guess they think these days they can get away with just running things close to their specifications and, you know, hope they get out of warranty and that sort of thing. But um, certainly not the best design ever. Um, yeah, you think the, the outputs would be the things that get hot, but it's just these little because these just run on standby all the time. Often have this amp just sitting there doing not much, but the power on, and that's why these get so hot. So a bit of a silly design, really. But I don't think I'll worry about actually putting a heatsink on those. But if I was, you know, if I wanted to keep this amp going for a long sort of time, I think you'd you'd probably be able to bend up a couple of bits of aluminium or something and screw through the front you might have to take the chips off the board mount it on with a bit of heat sink paste and have them come up and fold across the back here or something away from this board obviously and that would probably dissipate a lot of that heat and get it out of the amp vents rather than having it cooking everything around the board and all the capacitors so i'll get into that now we'll change the chips and uh, the caps and see what happens Okay, that is Ooh, hard to read. C six ninety nine, I think. Hard to read it over. It says it says something completely different there, right? Oh, that's a transistor, that's a Q number. Hmm, that makes it difficult. What do we got? Let's see if I can magnify this thing. Yes, C899 is the first one. Almost impossible to read that, it's just... They've left the circuit board showing through the green lacquer there. Which is a 35100. I've only got a heap of these. 100 mic 63 volters which are quite large but they'll generally last a bit longer in a situation where there's lots of heat I could mount off the board a couple of these I won't bother don't 
Just obviously make sure you get the polarity right on all of these. Yep, positive on the right side. And with its leads, we've got three of them over here I've marked. Right on the edge of the board under these connectors. 47. Don't make this easy. 40, I think they're all 47, 35 volts. At least they should be easy to find once you find one. Damn lead in the way. Uh, now I've lost sight of them. Oh yeah, they're in this group and over in this screw hole here by the look of it. Uh, mounted in all sorts of different ways. Third one. The leads bent over a bit, which is annoying, but often the case. Just uh, use your pace as you pull them out to double check the value is what you thought it was, and that the positive lead is where it's marked on the board. Very rare you find they're not, but sometimes usually if it is marked wrong it the capacitor will be in the right way but the sometimes they've marked the board incorrectly so if you follow the board markings alone you may put it in the wrong way I think I have seen it once maybe so just always check the capacitor as you pull it out is is does have the positive lead where it says the positive lead goes and vice versa which these all do they're all 47s. Not sure I've got much hope of reading. It's on the other side of the board. What their, their location numbers are. I think that says 618. Damned if I know what that says. 802 maybe. I'm going to have to magnify these because I cannot. That's the worst writing, they're not actually screen printed on with black letters like they normally would. I guess not much point these days since most of this goes to the tip rather than gets just repaired. C802 I think one is. What on earth does that say? That just says C8... No idea, 81 something maybe? Useless. And C818. Yeah, there's, I think, oh, what have they done there? It looks like they've printed two component the diode number and the cap number on top of each other or something weird. Anyway. Let's find some 47s. Come here. So we should have a positive there. Always pace to check your caps as you put them in as well, because even though you might have them in a bag or parts drawer or whatever, no guarantee that the right thing's in there. Obviously, if the size is right, it probably is, but again, you should always check as you go. Get this stupid wire out of the way. Don't want to take it off, because then I'll forget I have to put it back on, but... Always bend the leads a bit just to hold them in place so they don't move around. If anything does move while you're soldering it, just solder the other lead and then go back to the one that moved and re-solder it just to be sure you haven't made a dry joint. That one I'm not 100% happy with. Yeah, that's all right. It's a bit messy when you're doing multiple ones. You can chop the leads off as you go. But I tend to just do the lock. One operation at a time, solder then cut. 
These old side cutters are just about had their day, I think. I had a feeling I bought some new ones, but no idea what they are if I did. There probably are some new ones somewhere. Yeah, where were those leads? I just want a couple of those moved a little bit when I got a little bit hard to cut with those cutters, so I'll just double check, resolder them. Always make sure you're not making dry joints as you go. So with that one, those three. Now the next one's around these voltage regulators here. We've got two small ones, a hundred again, and a forty-seven again. So at least they're sticking to pretty standard values. I think I'm gonna have to get rid of that clip lead. It's gonna catch the camera every time otherwise. That's the I no, so can't really read it very well. Right next to there is the transistor or IC. So they're down in this area. Must be these two here. I see a capacitor logo on the board there. Really helps when they give you something to go with. But not all of them do. They may just be chasing around in a forest a little legs and and solder blobs yeah that's it trying to trying to work out which ones are watch component so you need some pretty good navigation skills now that be the hundred didn't get to check which way around that was but anyway hundred on the left and 47 on the right. At least if you've got the manual, you can always look them up if you forget what they were. But I try not to do that, I'll just try to remember as I go. You don't usually don't have a manual. And definitely 47. And it's the right way around. Yep, and that is C. C894 or something, what does that say? That's near impossible to read. C... It's 896 I think. And our other one... Oh god, there's dust all over it, which doesn't help. Yeah, I'm going to have to wipe that dust off, I think. It's an 80 something, I think. C808, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's C808, which was the 100 mic. Uh, I'll find a capacitor that I haven't used before. And yeah, negative that way. And positive that way. So I think I'll just poke them down in there. Ideally, they'd probably be mounted above the board a bit, but then you do risk if they wobble around too much, it's a possible they'll create dry joints or something one day, but... Yep, negative to the top on both of them, or top when it's upside down like this. So that'll hopefully stop. I think there was a bit of digital type noise coming out of this amp when it was had no signal though I thought that was my converter from USB to the amp but it turns out it may well be uh, these faulty caps in this thing okay now there's a couple of those here which I guess are power supply related more than amp related I'm guessing looks like another hundred I think it's C807 and what's this little one I think that's a 4.7 uh, look at that it's below that I see I can see the circuit symbol for a capacitor there oh so I'll just open these to clean out Oh, well, 
was I? That one there. With practice you get the hang of finding things on these boards and even when I looked away then I still went straight back to where it was. And that track's coming off a little bit of ink and there's the other one there. Doesn't help when they bend these pins over on these really fine really fine pads. And yeah, trying to get them off without wrecking anything. So this is the one in front of the oops, I think a bit of the pad went then. Yep, most of the pad's gone on that one. That should be the 100 mark. Oh, great, yeah, it's ripped the... Ripped the part of the pattern where it connects onto the other side there, so I have to probably just use the pigtail off the... Put the fine screwdriver here. Uh, scrape a bit more onto that green there. Get a bit more copper showing, so I've got something to work with. Yeah, I've got one side there and the other. I think I'll just run a pigtail to the next component. And we're going to get this other little mongrel out. Oh no. Press the wrong bloody capacitor. Where are you? I can't find that one. And I think I've broken the bed on that one now. Other than that, or just the solder's broken. Oh, come on. You can see why most people don't want to fix surround sound amps. Because they really aren't much fun to work on. Yeah, it's a 4.750 volt. Positive towards the chip. I can't even see a component number for that one. Oh there it is maybe, is that it on the end? Oh man. Could be a C601 I think. Possibly. Ah, 4.7. Oh, I'm getting beer in the cupboard of these. Oh, we've got 100 volts, so what was the other one? 50 volt, well 100 volts is plenty then. If I said towards the chip or the voltage regulator, for some reason I've bent the pins on that. Where am I there? And a hundred mic is the other one, which has its positive away from the chip. And I've got to see why. Uh, I think I've broken the bloody track on that. It's a pretty flimsy circuit board, this one. And that pad's partly gone as well. I'm getting into very fine circuit board pads here. And unfortunately, just me pressing down on that other capacitor, the wrong capacitor with my fingers actually broken it off the pads or broken the pads off the... ah oh, this one's coming off too I think these are terrible where'd that go? yeah it hasn't broken it I think but yeah it's starting to... my god these things are flimsy See, I can't even bend the lead without it near ripping the the pad off the board. This is shocking, this amp. But this is a problem with round amps. They've got so much stuff crammed into such a small space. That's why they run hot for starters. I can just tease that down a bit. They run extremely hot. Everything jammed in a small space. Uh, 
and because everything's jammed in on a small space, all the tracks are small on the circuit board. Which is just another added layer of annoyance. So what I can do with that is just turn on my component leads away. Where's my tin copper wire? Good question, I might just get one of these caps with used leads on it, that I'll have to do for now. But where I've pressed on this other cap I've broken the the pads on the board. I actually might be able to recover that. Oh maybe it hasn't actually broken the pads off. Maybe it is more the solder than the pads. Yeah, I've managed to solder it back on by look of it. It has taken a little bit of one of these pads. Oh, we've got a dry to in there by look of it. Yeah thankfully it I only took a part of it, that seems to be soldered on well. This other one's loose as, but it's... I don't think it's broken the copper, but my god. That is such a flimsy board. And it doesn't help that the... The thing gets so hot... That it tends to start lifting pads off the board just from that. I think to be safe I'll solder some wire across there. Stuff's getting too small for my eyes to see now. They're not as young as they used to be. And this is just the old through bleed through hole stuff. When you get into the surface, man, it's far worse than this. And you know, I really kind of lost interest in fixing that sort of stuff. It's like doing watch repair or something. Very fine stuff. Yeah, that is annoying. How am I going to get that across there? Without bridging the other one. Well, in fact, actually, the fact I've got one capacitor, one end, one lead on should be enough anyway. That'll mechanically hold it there, I think, so that it doesn't matter if I touch it. Oh yeah, it's much more solid. Yeah, it's a little loose there, but I probably should double check that with the multimeter and just double check that it is indeed connected still, yeah. I've resolder that I see already, it looks a bit iffy, but I think it's just the light. So now we should just have the capacitors. I better just double check that one, I guess. Definitely not shorter to that. Oh, where does that pad go all over the place? It's obviously connected to that. Yes, yeah, so that, that under mic was coming out of the voltage regulator, so that would definitely let a bit of rubbish down the line. That's this one here. Comes straight out of this voltage regulator by the look of it and filters the line there so you certainly get some digital rubbish on there if it's not working we've got a hundred a hundred I wish I could see what that one was but of course they've hidden it ah, these damn boards in the way that's a something point something 4.750 those two are a hundred I guess we're gonna have the same on the other channel hundred Hundred, so I'm guessing the other one's a 4.7 and which I just ran out of didn't I so I might have to put some tens in there I think So I think we might get those little ones done. So they're the end of each set of three So there's our amp chip I can see a capacitor symbol there really got to try and minimize the amount of heat you put into this board and just try and flick these loose might be better to grab the capacitor and flick them loose but you can just get them but if the, if the pad stays at all stuck to the to the lead you're in trouble and because it's bent to it it's 
no way of getting all the solder off. There's another cap, another cap, and we're on the next chip, and that's the first cap, so that should be. Pair of 4.7s. I think I've got plenty of 10 microfarad caps, but I could be wrong about that as well. But anything will be better than what these are, even a 1 mic would probably do a better job. Now I'm moving it, but I can't seem to grab hold of it. It's another thing you get good at over the years is actually just putting your finger completely on the other side of the board where you can't see it and grabbing the right part just by feel it's a 4.750 pull it up oh, I can't even grab hold of this one because it's sometimes you've got to use pliers or something but yeah I've got him again positive up 4.7 yeah, that's going to depend on what I have. And yes, I do have plenty of tens by the look of it. Always a capacitor, I keep plenty in stock because a 10 will always do in place of a 4.7 or something. Normally they're not that critical. So more capacitance is better, and in this sort of situation where there's a lot of heat attacking the caps, they will last a bit longer before they lose their capacitance hopefully they might may dry out just as quickly but it may mean they keep it a bit longer positive up you can always tell too because the positive lead is the long one on these electros so from, even from under the board you can tell if you've got it on the right way if you make a mental note which way they faced in this case I'll just say towards the top of the board is a positive which is how I put them in and I can also see the leads are longer on that side so that helps okay Oops, I'll try to cut another one there and go away. And the rest are all hundreds. So I don't even really need to flip the board or check anything. I can see the little cap diagrams underneath. It's almost like they predicted someone would be having to change these things. And that's one I just changed. So there must be one there. And just being super careful not to leave any bits of solder on the board or bridge anything out. And that's the last one. Not good when these leads are bent over. Sometimes you just got to prise your solder tip between another pin of another component. Just trying and make sure the solder's melted before you leave or anything. Or oh, you'll take the track off with it. negative up it's 
sometimes you can feel oh, this one's tipped over, that's why I can't find it. Negative up, just double check it's 100 again. Hang on. Yeah. For a minute I thought it said one microphone. Uh, now I'm going to. Uh, Negative up again, yes. Definitely a hundred mic. The other reason to check is to make sure you've actually unsolded the right thing, because if you pull out a different value cap, you've probably actually got the wrong one. Ooh, what's moving there? Other one. Come on, where are you? Of course, now that's making me push that one with the loose circuit board pads on it. That's got it. 100. So I'm going to have to check that again. So yeah, negative away from the chip. Away from the chip. Oh, it's only one of these that hasn't been used at some point to test something. Again, negative away. Negative away. Let's see if someone's actually going to bother to recap a whole amp. It's quite a tedious process. And you know, most of them will be good anyway. Certainly these ones in, a, in the hot areas, it wouldn't hurt as a bit of routine maintenance or preventative maintenance. But it's still quite a bit of work to change them all. It's not something you should do unnecessarily. Doubt any of these caps sound any better than any others, as some people will tell you. Okay, I'll just sit this back in place. I've got my protection circuit mitigation and clip lead in place. I'm going to get rid of some of these old capacitors that are everywhere. So there's quite a handful of those we've changed. So I think that's all the ones I've changed. Right, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen of them. Which hopefully adds up to how many? Three, six, eight. Ah, oh, three, six, eight, yep, yeah, ten, twelve, fourteen, yep. So, I'm going to plug it in and see if anything goes bang, any smoke comes out, anything exciting like that. Again, just make sure I've got the board sitting where it's meant to sit. Seems pretty right. If it, the screw holes line up, nothing should be shorting out. Well, we've got the display back. Protection relays clicked in. Okay. I might actually put a couple of screws. I'm not really fussed about pulling the screws in and out a bit, so I'll put a couple of screws, the ones with the other things, back in the, the main board just so I can't move when I'm plugging things in and stuff. I feel a bit safer when it's like that. Now yeah, I can't remember, was it the short screws or long screws when in these circuit boards? Should be the short ones, yeah, the other one's got short ones, so... That should sort that out, and then I can actually swing this thing right around to get to the sockets and stuff. Oops, there goes the camera. I'll just get these speakers connected up. I 
again if the protection circuit's doing its thing you can hear the relay click then you shouldn't have any DC issues on the output or anything so normally if that clicks in I don't actually bother checking it even though technically I probably should but let's see if I can get a signal into those CD inputs I suspect that noise is probably something to do with me not having the back panel on. So I think I'll just put the back panel on and plug the other tuner and stuff back in so everything's reconnected. And if we've still got problems then you know it's something you've done or some fault you haven't fixed. But chances are that is all these metal bits on the back here or some sort of earthing that should get rid of that what is probably just digital noise from the various chips in here the microprocessor and stuff like that oh, actually going back on what the hell is holding that off ah. Ah, I know what it is. Some idiot put a couple of screws in there for the earth wire. That'll stop the panel going back on. screw everything that has an earth thing on it back to the back panel which in this case is the multi-channel sockets on the end left and right front and surround then the between the CD and mini disc tape thing there's one on this coaxial DVD LD in socket, the digital socket. I might press it on there just a transistor or something. There's one on the front speakers. On the right hand side screw all that. And then there's one right next to that that goes onto the power board. And I'll do one to the chassis as well. Put this middle one down here. So then all the earth stuff is pinned together. I don't think this digital board will matter, or video board I mean, but having those wires hanging out there could be creating some sort of interference or something. You just never know with these things. screw back in that. That looks like it's got an earthed connection as well. So it's possible even having that out and not earthed on the back could cause some problem. And again the tuner board because that is basically an earthed box I wouldn't put it past them to connect something from up through that onto the back panel or something like that so I think the safest thing on this modern stuff is just screw all these things back in place temporarily, at least with one screw and then at least that's not a source of any hassles whether the amp will work again with them there or not I don't know but I don't really need to put the second one uh, maybe I'll shoot with the tuner but I think the whole thing's a metal box all joined to itself But some engineer might have had a different idea. So I'm 
I'll get the speakers back on this thing. And it may be no different but to before, but at least we know it's not an earthing issue then. Because this the main circuit board's got the two screws in that go also go to the chassis with an earth little metal thing around under the screw. At least I think that was the only two, it should be. Pretty sure I checked reasonably well, unless there's one I missed somewhere in the middle. I guess even the... I can't imagine the heat sinks would matter, but there should be enough contact with the board anyway. And where's my signal source? Now it's possible that signal source is also where that horrible sound is coming from. It may not be any good. That's my signal generator, but I don't know for sure that it's working right. Bingo. So we've both got the sound back and the lack of, well, let's we'll find out if it's a lack of, a little bit of hiss there as you'd expect in the background when I turn the volume way, way up. So I, the problem I had with no audio coming through, obviously again in this earthing somewhere. Bit of noise in the volume there, which I think I'm missing a channel. Possibly. That could just be these speaker connectors know what they like. Yep, definitely. Ah. Turn that horrible noise down a bit. It seems to be this lead. I've got a wire adapter. RCA wire adapter here, but that lead does not seem to do a thing. Well, that's a rare thing. Show me the lead is a faulty. It's been lying around on the floor here, and it is pretty old. Anything's possible. Any typical or something like that to play up. Yep, leads open circuit. Unbelievable. <laughs> yep, the one channel on that lead is naked, so that can go to scrap metal. I'll find another one on the floor here, that'll do. That's why you probably shouldn't store your leads on the floor, because. They may get trodden on or something and it won't work next time. It's one channel. Oops, still around here a second channel. No, it's there. It still seems a bit low, although I know why. I know exactly why, because from memory this amp before I fixed it, I had to put the balance right to one side to even get one channel to work much at all. Um, where on earth is it in here? Dynamic range. Ah, found balance again, yay. Now how do I set the mongrel? Ah. So it's something to do with this level thing. Okay, balance is balanced again, finally. Well, up to the ear it sounds all right. So you've got to press this level switch, you know, that's how you get balance up and then you can go plus or minus, so that's how we do it, it's not through the setup or anything else, so really annoying. Can't get rid of that thing now, doesn't look like it. But we've got plenty of volume again by sound of it and good balance between the channels, so it definitely seems to have fixed it. All these capa capacitors in here. And if I turn that off. Yeah, a bit of hiss when you really go loud. That's at maximum volume, so that's pretty good. It did have a bit of a weird 
squealy sound than I think before. That volume seems to make a little bit of switching noise. Ah, uh, you know what that could be? There's an earth I've missed there. I didn't even do that. Oh, that should be. There is one earth pin I can see on this little digital board here. There's one over the other side here, so that could even be part of it. So I think we'll call that thing fixed. I might just do a check in a second to see on the oscilloscope compare the outputs for the same level but that's about all it needs doing but thankfully this seems to be back in working order so it actually had it would go into protection and I had no audio coming through which and that horrible digital hash sound coming through all because of the back panel being off so it just goes to show you can't trust these new ones um, if you pull on the bits and you're stuck in weird problems, try earthing everything out again. Really annoying because you can't just work with it with the board out. I mean, you can get enough done with the board out to fix it. But a lot harder to actually fault find these things while they're running. When they have all sorts of issues. I couldn't even get audio through the thing. It only seemed to go part way in. Uh, just because the back was off. So but I think we'll call this one fixed for now. So, uh, thanks for watching.